if um, if the National Association of Mayors, big cities, you know, and other entities around the world came to you and said, Peter, what scares you the most about uh, urban water supply? What, what would be at the top of your list? What would you do to just you know shake their shake their shoes? What scares me the most is running out. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Intelligent Community, the podcast of the Intelligent Community Movement. I'm Luz Zaccarella, a founder of the Intelligent Community Forum in New York. Among the many issues facing leaders of regions, cities, and towns worldwide, especially agricultural-based ones, is the crisis of land management and water supplies and, of course, things we've been talking about for a while, climate change. Today, we're going to start a conversation by asking one of the world's preeminent experts on the subject, how do you manage drought in an agricultural economy? What happens to an agricultural community when water use is limited? How does the profile and social response of the place change? So we hope to be able to guide leaders and their industries, agro or otherwise, through this increasingly difficult field of drought and water shortage and the politics that are usually hovering right over them. Dr. Peter Williams has over 35 years experience helping businesses and governments adapt to and make the most of new technology. Formerly the CTO of IBM's Big Green Innovations Unit, he played a key role in the development of IBM's Smarter Planet businesses in the areas of water management, smart cities, and disaster resilience, among others. He helped direct applications of technology to public infrastructure and public services. Dr. Williams was the lead author of the United Nations City Disaster Resilience Scorecard which is now in use by hundreds of cities across the globe. He presently leads the US network of ARISE, a UN vehicle for enabling public-private collaboration in disaster risk reduction. And we'll ask him a little bit about that. Peter was named an IBM Distinguished Engineer. He has lectured at Stanford University for years on smart cities and communities. He advises startups in the area under discussion and uh, there is much more about him. His PhD was awarded from the University of Bath in England. Dr. Peter Williams, welcome to the Intelligent Community. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again. Um, Peter, you've worked in this field for a long, long time, as I said. Can you kind of give us um, a, an overview, an assessment from the top of the mountain, like the one behind you, uh, of the evolution that we're now in in the middle of 2022 as it relates to water shortages and drought? and sort of the what's perceived as a global crisis so leave aside the perturbations that have come from the ukraine some context water agriculture excuse me uses something like 70 percent of the uh, fresh water resources in the world at 70 percent of the consumptive use of fresh water and yet depending on how you measure it anyway something like 35 percent of all of the food calories grown in the world are wasted so if you do the math, 35% of 70% of the world's consumptive use of fresh water, that's a lot of water. Um, if we can address the wastage problem, we start to address the uh, water problem. That wastage arises in the supply chain, but above all, it, it arises in the retail, um, in, the, in the retail sector and in people's domestic refrigerators and in restaurants. Um, so that's, that's the first place I start to look. The second uh, area, the second sort of general contextual point is that most of the technologies you need to manage drought have been around for years. They're just not used. Um, you know, a water meter is really not a very sophisticated technological device, even if it's too limited. Um, precision agriculture, uh, or at least um, precision agriculture techniques, even if you exclude the software and the applications that are available, have been around for years. It is well known that if you water uh, over water fields and over apply nitrate, most of that nitrate and most of that water runs off and pollutes the environment. Whereas if you restrict the application of nitrate and <clears throat> are more focused in your use of water, um, a lot more of that water stays around uh, to actually nourish the crops. The Israelis have made massive um, use of drip irrigation to support a thriving uh, 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 sector in, the, um, in what is fundamentally a desert uh, environment. Um, 
here in the United States, um, some of the Native American tribes publish uh, a practice, um, different kinds of agriculture attuned to the desert. And I've personally um, been to the Hopi um, nation and seen them growing watermelons in the desert. Um, so the techniques are there, it can be done. Um, the technology is there. All of the artificial intelligence is uh, either there or rapidly developing. What isn't there is the uh, application of that technology to um, the matter at hand. Um, too much of it is done the same as it was always done, you know, like the old uh, the old um, uh, talking head song, same as it ever was, you know. Same as it ever was. <laughs> yeah, well, great song, but uh, kind of a rough story that you that you just lay out. But it's consistent with human beings, right? Uh, resistance to change. Peter, you spent a lot of time at IBM though trying to to both change the approach um, to mobilize the tools, both ones that were in existence and ones that, that you guys were developing there. As you look at it now, as you advise companies now, um, how, where do you start? Is it, a, is it a change of organizational consciousness or is there some other kind of incentive that needs to get motivated for uh, what you described changes to come as we see in Israel or the Hopis? There are um, a few companies um, that kind of get it. Um, and when you're advising them, it's look, you know, um, these are the technologies that can best meet your need. Um, and, um, you know, here's an evaluation of them and so on and so forth. And here's how you think about deploying them. And it's relatively straightforward. There are a lot of companies that um, kind of, sort of a beginning to get it, I suppose you'd say, um, but don't really know how to, how to work their way through it. There's a lot of them that have um, what you might call dumb products that they're trying to turn into smart products through the application of sensing, um, the use of the better use of data about how the product is deployed. And the, the traditional irrigation companies are examples of that. Um, you, know, you know, in terms of the sort of weather dependent um, uh, um, drip irrigation, weather dependent spray irrigation and so on and so forth. Um, and there's a number of well-established services out there now that, um, that, that that kind of address that. And then there are some companies, I guess, that just haven't even bothered to really start thinking about it. Or mm -hmm. if they have, they're, they're literally, they're just kind of getting around to it now. So it's, it's, quite, it's really quite a spectrum. If you're asking me where the center of gravity is, it's somewhere along that, uh, uh, you know, if you imagine a continuum of, um, you know, don't know, don't care through dimly aware there's a problem through taking concrete action. We are kind of just past dimly aware there's a problem on average, I would say. Yeah, early stage. Um, yeah. Are, are there, you know, at the Intelligent Community Forum, we talk a lot about the triple helix where the private sector works with a local or regional government and um, the academic uh, or the innovation sector. Um, have you seen any types of collaborations um, in that agricultural space, perhaps in, in Israel, which you just described, where you could say, you know, that that's probably a best practice that would export across uh, 200 or 300 additional communities? I don't know so much about collaboration. I know where government policy has stimulated change, mm -hmm. um, and Israel would be a case example. Uh, a great example, the kind of water trading that happens in Australia um, was sort of stimulated by um, government policy as well. Um, These are national governments, right? National or state governments, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about the situation here in California where I live, um, mm -hmm. where um, one, as you, I'm sure you know, we're facing a pretty um, historic drought. Um, and two, the Central Valley of California is one of the one of the largest, if not the largest, agricultural regions in the whole of the United States. Right. Um, the Californian government, state government, has um, now mandated reporting requirements on the use of groundwater. Um, that is not going entirely smoothly. Um, they've created sort of groundwater management districts, um, and some of those have succeeded in in creating groundwater management plans. Some of them are in litigation. Um, some of them are a tug of war between the big growers and the small growers. Some of them are a tug of war between the water utility and all the growers. Um, some of them have had an application of common sense, if you will, and they're sort of planning together. It's really quite a patchwork, actually. Um, and it's really quite, uh, um, quite, quite entertaining. My PhD was in politics. I live in California and I have a background in water management and all of those things come together. Oh yeah. It's, um, it's, it's really, uh, it's really quite a fascinating, um, uh, sort of set of conundrums, you know? 
But I want to get back to the uh, to the Israeli model. Um, you mentioned the drip irrigation um, policy and, and work that they do there. Can you just give us a little bit of a snapshot as to what that is? I mean, there may be listeners out there that don't know what that type of irrigation is, and then how it how it comes about. How it I don't about. know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was direct if there is a policy that says thou shalt use drip irrigation but the fact is that israel has some fairly stringent water management policies and companies like netafim and a few others were putting um drip irrigation together some years back mm -hmm. um, actually even in india uh, i believe the line i'm right i'm right in saying that the largest drip irrigation manufacturer in the world is jane industries from uh, from india um so wherever there is a water crisis you start to see this kind of innovation starting to happen in california California, um, the Cal, uh, the the UC system, um, and um, Cal State in Fresno and Bakersfield, uh, along with the UCs in Merced and uh, and um, excuse me in Davis, are um, very very active in building sort of um, innovation communities uh, and so forth. Especially Fresno, actually, um, uh, and so you're starting to see you know. Um, or they've been going for some years, sort of tech incubators focused on agriculture, focused on water, focused on uh, hyper accurate weather forecasting and so on and so forth. Um, so those kinds of uh, innovations, they tend to be driven by a crisis in the first place. Yeah. And so they've moved beyond dimly aware in, in yes. those instances, right? Yes. But I think, yeah, I think so. I mean, oh, I suppose there's a, there's a stop along that, um, that spectrum of denial as well, but um, yes. <laughs> maybe it's a key the cost thing. You know, yeah, I was just key. thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, seven you know, stages. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're you're mourning you're, you're mourning for a uh, an abundant water situation that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can't through, so through the stages of grief for it. Right. Well, usually you get to a point of acceptance if you're you know if you're if you're wise enough, right? Um, and some have and some have not. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the technology. Um, you know, I know from, from my own background the the virtues now of Earth observation satellites. We've got no excuse now uh, when we do our precision agriculture, when we look at the earth, uh, we know exactly what's going on. And so we can take the steps. It's a, it's a wonderful tool to have an earth observation satellite fleet uh, looking at your fields and providing you with data. How about artificial intelligence? Where Where is artificial intelligence playing a role in, in this issue? Yeah. Um, various kinds of interpretation of the images. So for example, um, if you take two images three months apart of a particular crop, the change in greenery will tell you how much that crop has grown. And if you know what that crop is, um, you can infer how much water it must have taken to, to get it to where it is. Right. Um, so th those kind of uses. Um, I'm aware of one company that was trying to use AI to um, understand from the satellite photos, not just that this is a tree crop versus a row crop, but what actual, what kinds of trees are they actually growing? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if they succeeded in doing that yet, but then you'd be able, you'd have very, very accurate data about, let's say, your pecan acreage or your almond acreage or your wheat acreage or your corn acreage. Um, and from that, with the satellite photos, you'd be in, a, you'd be in the business of forecasting, um, probably forecasting yields as well. Yeah. If, um, if the National Association of Mayors, big cities you know, and other entities around the world came to you and said, Peter, what scares you the most about... Uh, urban water supply. What, what would be at the top of your list? What would you do to just, you know, shake their shake their shoes? Um, what scares me the most is running out. Um, <laughs> and having to live out. That would be at the out, top of the list. Yeah. Having to live off a water tanker. You know. Mm -hmm. um, what would I do? Uh, well, here in California, it's the the whole irrigation thing. Um, you know, lawns. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty. I've got a lawn out the front of my house right now. Um, you know, I only water it for eight minutes, twice uh, every second day. Um, and it's starting to look a bit brown and ratty. And I know for a fact that my homeowners association will be tapping me on the shoulder and telling me to water my lawn some more. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, so that kind of, um, uh, that, that kind of thing will be, um, you know, very much top of the list. Um, fixing the leaks. In every urban water system, the average in the United States is something like 14% of the water that's put into that system is lost through leaks. Uh, and 14%. Some, people say, some people say it's 20. Um, that's a lot, right? Oh my um, if, yeah. if people only knew, right, what it takes to make a fresh glass of water. Yeah. Uh, another one uh, that not a lot of people know, moving water around this country, and I just, you, I just mean moving it as opposed to heating it or treating it, 
uses between three and five percent of the electricity output of the entire United States. Wow. It's, more, it's more in California because of the geography, but on average, it's between three and five percent. Again, do the math. You've got 14 to 20 percent leaking out through pipes, all other things being equal, that will have been treated and pumped. How much energy would you save and how many greenhouse gas emissions would you have saved if that leakage was stopped? Quite apart mm -hmm. from the water saving directly. Um, you know, there's there's some obvious, in my mind, really obvious low hanging fruit. Yeah. When we, the, the subject of this series is leadership in challenging times. Um, now, if if the local government, you know, went to your uh, your, your association, um, condo association or whatever it is, homeowners association rather, and said, we're going to you know pass an ordinance that uh, from now on you have to do what Frank Lloyd Wright said, which was put in front of your house, what actually is there. You know whether it's tumbleweed or, or whatever, um, there would be this great conflict, especially in the United States, probably uh, in other parts of the West. That say, no, you're you're screwing with my freedom. Yeah, and oh, totally. all of a sudden you've got this tension. Totally, totally. Uh, and there are side effects too, actually. I mean, you know, where they've introduced air escaping in in Las Vegas and Phoenix, one of the one of the side effects is that you actually increase the urban heat island effect because an, irrig an irrigated lawn is a pretty good evaporative cooler. Mm -hmm. um and they they reckon that in in extreme cases it can be somewhere between one and two degrees um increase in temperature from losing your um irrigated lawn um so you know it's not without side effects um mm -hmm. but 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 equally yeah you're right it, it, you know there's there's people tend to regard and it's not just the us and it's true in the uk where i'm from originally people tend to regard consumption as their god-given right um and we're going to bump into plenty of that um, you've got very large houses in California where people use ungodly amounts of water uh, per day or per week, mainly on their landscaping. And as you say, they seem to regard it as their right to do that. Peter, I'll just, uh, just sort of shift that a little bit. How serious an issue is, is water quality degradation on top of the shortage of water? Because I, I know, well, yeah. <laughs> So clearly in some parts of the United States, um, you know, I'm thinking of the Flint's of this world and also some of the communities in the deep south where the water is known not to be safe to drink. Right. Um, in a civilized country, there is no excuse for that. Um, and now there were some very specific circumstances in Flint and I believe, you know, people are, in, are going to go to court for it. Uh, but, um, you know, there is no excuse. Um, I believe that on average, certainly around here i mean i i I'm, I'm lucky i guess a large part of the water that i drink is snow melt from the sierras and it's some of the purest softest water in the world mm. um that's not true elsewhere um there's things like agricultural runoff in it nitrate runoff in it yes. um, there's lead in it phosphorus. Uh, there's phosphorus there's um hexavalent chromium in it there's god knows what you know um so i suspect that the quality issue is probably more widespread than um, is often realized, even well, though it's not it's universal. Well, I can tell you for a fact, um, as I was doing some pre preparation here, um, the east end of Long Island, which you know I, I happen to have a home there, that's a pretty affluent part of the world. And they're very concerned about it because of the overdevelopment, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, but they've been, but it, you know, to your point, they've been innovating there. They're looking at things, uh, Stony Brook University is looking at um, sugar kelp, as a, yep. it's, it's native to the to the region out there, and they're having some pretty good success with the oyster populations yep. and, and absorbing yep. the phosphorus and the nitrates. Yep. Um, when you when you speak, Peter, about the tools that are available to us, is is, is that something that could be significant that we need to look into yeah. more? Well, ecosystem services, yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned the UN City Scorecard. That's divided into ten chapter headings called the Ten Essentials. Essential number five is natural buffers. Um, and that includes things like oyster reefs. That includes things like wetlands, which are fantastic pollution remediators. Um, it includes things like woodland um, and so on and so forth, which can prevent flash flooding and, 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 and things like that. So yeah, absolutely essential. Is, is there, um, I know you work with a lot of startup companies and you have uh, a lot of exposure to them. Is there a technology out there um, that you're looking at that a small to mid-sized community um, could 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 implement tomorrow to help with their water management and, and water quality? 
Yeah, there are. Um, so <laughs> difficult to know where to start there. The, the, the short answer to your question is yes, and but let me qualify that. Most of the water software that you buy is um, it tends to be the preserve of larger, more, um, uh, more, more, well, better staffed anyway, uh, water utilities. Um, there are, however, now um, very simple, straightforward kind of iPad based applications that are starting to be deliberately marketed for smaller utilities. Mm -hmm. um, they're out there um, and they're starting to get considerable amounts of traction. Um, it, it, here in the US, I don't know if you know this, but there's something like 50,000 or 50 some thousand separate water systems, of which over 30,000 have got fewer than 500 customers. Um, so, so there's a huge market for, uh, or potential market, albeit one that will only buy very, lots of very small amounts. Um, you know, you're not going to be selling SaaS software for 50, 50 grand a year because they simply don't have that. But if you can sell them some something really basic that allows them basic handle on their pumping, basic handle on their leaks, basic handle on their operational management, quality management of the water system and so on. Um, you know, that's, um, that, that, that's the thing for which it is evident that there is a growing market. In other words, said differently, the technology is trickling down now from the leaders to the long tail. Yeah, that uh, sort of lends itself to be our senior fellow, uh, Dr. Norm Jack, calls um, um, the collective metropolitan area, which is, you know, bundling 500 or 600 communities at a time to look at technologies that individually are not affordable, but they can be done, uh, bundled and purchased uh, as sort of a cooperative or collective. Are you, right. seeing, are you seeing anything like that uh, at, at any scale? I've seen it where you have different water utilities share some interconnection pipe or some piece of infrastructure where they will, um, you know, agree the same software. Um, well, at least <laughs> sometimes they'll agree the same software to manage right. to manage that piece of infrastructure. Um, I'm not seeing any kind of buying collectives as such. I guess the, um, you know, the um, sort of the the. Um, the, the NGOs that represent cities and small um, uh, small towns and so on in the US sometimes have preferred buyer type arrangements, um, preferred supplier type arrangements rather. So um, you, you're getting it to that degree. The cooperative thing though, no, not yet. It would be a logical thing, especially for a rural state to sponsor for all its communities, wouldn't it? Um, but the, um, uh, the issue will be getting agreement as to exactly what that software should actually do. Um, and get an agreement as to exactly what data it will ingest, what will happen to that data, um, and so on and so forth. So those are typically the kinds of issues that um, um, will arise. And also, um, not least, how many additional sensors do you need? Because if you're putting the software out there, you probably don't want to be entering data into that manually. You, you're going to have to negotiate some kind of sensor package to, uh, to be available alongside it as well. Right. Right. And then, of course, there's all the other incumbent privacy issues, which actually municipalities take seriously. Yes, they do. Uh, like, like the rest of society sometimes. Um, I, I do know that in, um, in Finland, uh, in the uh, Oulu uh, area, they were, um, they were collectivizing some municipalities and they were doing yep. some, some collective buying there of fire trucks and things of that yep. nature, which again... I think that kind of thing. I think that kind of thing goes goes on. So I'd be very surprised if you know you get the Association of California Water Agencies. I don't know for a fact that they do that, but I'd be I'd be relatively surprised if they did not. Or at least they'd have a tariff that you can quote when you're buying a fire truck. You know they'll have negotiated on behalf of their members that kind of thing. So I I I, I suspect there are arrangements like that across the country. Nothing kind of like consistent or anything, but you know there'll be a, uh, at least a good good smattering of that for a guess. <laughs> These, these places are still competitive with each other. We try to talk to them all, often about economic, uh, regional economic development, right? And say, you know, if, if Canadians are pretty good at it, but the Americans still, it's like that town over there, they wear gold or football team, that town wears white. And we're, there's, there's a reason for that, right? It's yeah, yeah. Very competitive. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but again, we, we keep working on them. Um, Peter, I, I mentioned that you're, um, with overseeing the uh, Arise US group mm -hmm. now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because it, uh, it's, sure. it's this conversation. So Arise is the, the vehicle um, established by the UN to encourage public-private collaboration in disaster resilience. 
Um, it's organized into national chapters. I think there's th something like 30 national chapters around the world of which the US is one, um, one of the most active at this point in time. Um, it's got a very strong presence in Latin America, uh, very strong presence in Southeast Asia, um, uh, places like the UAE, um, and is becoming very active in Africa. It hasn't tended to be so active in Europe simply because the European Union has tended to sort of fill the role that um, Arise would otherwise have offered and has been interested to build public-private collaboration anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, and we do um, pro bono work. Um, so, you know, we've got a number of tools and scorecards and things like that that we've created. They're available for free. At the same time, anybody can take them and build a for-profit service on the back of it as well. So that way we're stimulating um, economic activity at the same time. The motto, the watchword is doing well by doing good. Yeah. And, you know, if you do good, um, there's nothing to stop you doing well at the same time. Yep. Well, I was privileged to, you know, be able to, to attend and speak at uh, your last meeting. And um, it, it seemed to me that you were also trying to infuse a consciousness in the small oh, yeah. to, to medium sized uh, enterprise as well to, to do something that, again, you've been working on for three decades. And I want to ask you that as, as a final question, is this, is this going to get done? All the things we've been talking about this afternoon that you and I have been talking about for years, is it going to get done as sort of a global catalytic effort or is it going to get done community by community by community? I suspect it will get done disaster by disaster by disaster, either just before a disaster or just after one. Yeah. Most likely, sadly, just after one. Yeah. That's my guess. Um, you're going to find some countries have got um, fairly far reaching, um, you know, policy frameworks. And they've oftentimes are quite surprising countries, actually, Chile and the Philippines um, are both actually very good at it for the simple reason that they've they're both very disaster prone, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether from earthquakes or hurricanes or volcanoes or uh, whatever it might be. Right. Um, Japan's pretty good at it. Um, and, you know, no surprise, California is pretty good at sort of the earthquake stuff, um, you know, but uh, uh, California is now struggling with wildfires. Um, and, you know, we've I'm, we're doing a lot of work on wildfire um, resilience and we're finding um, you try to have a, com uh, a conversation with um, a large company. Right. Uh, about, you know, how wildfire issues affect them. So, you know, you point out that, um, you, okay, so you might have fireproofed your premises, but um, your your workforce, um, you know, the day after a wildfire, probably going to be more interested in uh, finding themselves a new house or uh, protecting their family or, uh, or whatever it might be. Um, your healthcare costs are definitely going to go up because a lot of more of your um, uh, workforce are going to have um, smoke inhalation um, side effects, which they now know can be <clears throat> lifelong. Um, you know, you're going to find that your supply chain into that area might be severely disrupted because people can't get up and down the roads. Don't you think that actually the wildfire is part of your concern? And they still turn around and say, no, the local government's going to deal with that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, these are very large companies you have heard of are saying this with billions of bucks invested um, in, in a given area. And right. they're still saying it. And it's, um, that shows how far we've got to go. Yeah. It, 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 and it just seems the matter of connecting the dots. You know, yeah. use your imagination. Here's what, here's what yeah. the consequences would be. They, they do that all the time in their business. Um, I think the, I think the, sorry, just one quick point. I think the um, changes that the SEC is now talking about, about a, um, reporting material risks, that is likely to drive somewhat of a change of attitude, I think. I'm seeing that in one company that I'm working with right now uh, in my own personal capacity as a consultant. Um, I'm seeing that. Um, and these guys, you know, they're a pharmaceutical company you have heard of. Um, and it's, you know, they're clearly starting to look at themselves and go, you know what, we've, there's a different game we've got to play here. Um, and, and they're trying to, you know, figure, figure their way towards it, which obviously is great to see. Is that, is that part of the ESG um, sort of thinking? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, it, it is it is directly part of the ESG thing, but actually disaster resilience is bigger than ESG. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's all about structural engineering as well, uh, for example. It's all about understanding of ecosystems, as we were just discussing, as well as being about social equity and um, being about the environment and so on and so forth. Um, so it's and, and urban ESG, planning but, and urban design, right? I mean, yeah, and urban planning, exactly right. Those, those um, ideas are but, all out there right now. Yeah, but ESG is definitely... Um, become a major driver of it, let's put it that way. Yeah, um, you know, Peter, just a, is a, a, again, a, a personal point of curiosity. When, there, when there's a wildfire, 
how much water is used and what type of water is it? Is it clean water that's used to combat wildfires? That'll, that'll vary on what's available. Um, oftentimes you see those surface skimming planes picking water up out of reservoirs. Um, that yeah. would have been drinking water. And the bigger issue actually is not the water that's used to put them out. It's the um, that red fire retardant stuff that they spray around because that poisons the environment for some years afterwards. It does. Um, yeah, you got no, you got no option, right? At the current point in time, that's 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 the technology that's available. So I'm not yeah. criticising anybody by saying that, but um, the, um, um, you know, that that that's as big an issue to my mind as the amount of water that's being used. That said, you can clearly show that if you can rehydrate a landscape by, for example, um, decanalizing uh, rivers. So, you know, where you've straightened them out and turned them effectively into canals, you can let them start meandering back so the wetlands come back. That acts as a fire buffer or can do. Um, so rehydrating the landscape in that sense um, reduces the predisposition to, um, to wildfires. Um, so, you know, water in that sense becomes very important, but not quite necessarily the way I think you had in mind when you asked the question. Right. But again, you're using, you're using nature to protect itself yeah. in that instance. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's a huge, there's a huge, huge spread of technologies that are used. So the, yeah, the satellite data on fire risk, on vegetation patterns, on uh, wind direction, and all that kind of stuff, vitally important. Um, but actually, you know, one of the best fire uh, fire risk reduction technologies mankind ever invented, it's a goat. A, a what? They eat a goat. Is it goat? They eat underbrush, uh, uh -huh. anything up to about third, third to half an inch thick. Um, and um, they will clear acres and acres and acres. They will eat anything. They'll eat poison oak, they'll eat anything. Um, and um, people are increasingly starting to realize that as well as mechanical underbrush clearance, where the stuff hasn't got too thick and the stems haven't got too thick, you can use goats to keep it under control. You're you, um, uh, manuring the land as you go, so fertilizing the land and you get meat and cheese off the back. Yeah, I was um, just gonna say, so and the cheese is terrific. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's a combination of high tech and low tech. So all of, all of the fancy sensors on power lines, all of the fancy satellite technology and goats. And the goats, <laughs> of course. Don't forget the yeah. goats. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Peter, you know, you've had, you're having such a, an amazing career. Um, um, what, do you, what do you see over the next three years as you do your work with Arise? Are, are, are you optimistic that the communities will pick this up irrespective of whether they need a disaster to wake, wake them up or not? Do you, do you think we're on the right path ultimately? Yeah, we're sort of on a path that's within 90 degrees of being right, I suppose, but we're going way too slow down it. Um, I mean, we are seeing communities pick it up. Um, you know, we're working on a, um, a, a rise is working with um, another organization on a pilot in a community uh, in the Santa Cruz mountains um, that has realized that they're sitting ducks for the next wildfire. There's only one road in and out of the place and they're at the top of a mountain. Um, so, you know, they've, they've realized they've got to do something. Um, you're starting to see that. Uh, I think, you know, the Sonoma and Napa fires were a huge wake up call. The, oh. the, the camp. The campfire was a huge wake up call. The thing, the stuff that's happened in Colorado this winter is another huge wake up call. The reason I mentioned those is because they're all in different kinds of terrain. You tend to think of wildfires as being a mountain phenomenon, the sort of preserve of the view behind me here. And the Caldor wildfire indeed burned within about a mile of my left shoulder. Um, but Napa and Sonoma are kind of rolling much more, um, um, you know, much more uh, manicured, much more um, uh, rural, so to say, in terms of farming and uh, vineyards and all that kind of thing. And the fires in Colorado uh, back at the start of the year, apart from being at a crazy time of the year for that stuff that happened, were on prairies. Yeah. And a lot of the fires in Texas and uh, that, that, that happened are on prairies. So there's all these different kinds of terrains have all of the, have, have their own characteristics. And that's what we're sort of um, starting to see people get to grips with now. Yeah, it's no longer the other guy's problem. Um, yep. Well, listen, Peter, uh, I really appreciate you making the time today. I know you got a lot going on, but uh, it's, it's always great to talk to you. So thanks for being a part of um, the intelligent community today. Always, uh, always good to speak with you as well. Uh, and um, look forward to uh, look forward to working with you in the future. All Very right. Cool. Likewise. And we'll, we'll, take a, we'll take a look at that goat franchise. Yeah, cool. All right. <laughs> I can introduce you to some goat growers. <laughs> <laughs> I love to see. I love to do that. Um, <laughs> take care. Take care. That's Dr. Peter Williams, and I'm Lou Zaccarella for The Intelligent Community, along with my producer, Matt Owen. And if you're going out, always remember, there really is no place like home. Take care, everybody. See ya. Bye-bye.